As you will know if you've watched any of my videos, I love reading translated fiction. Once you open yourself up to reading books that weren't written in your native language, you unlock so much incredible literature, and often very unique pieces of fiction too. To demonstrate the power and importance of this in the only way I know how, this week I'm going to be reading seven translated pieces of fiction in seven days. So, in this little haul, I have At Night All Blood Is Black, which is translated from French, Death and the Penguin, which is translated from Russian but written by a Ukrainian author, Heaven, translated from Japanese, My Pen is the Wing of a Bird, stunning title. This is written and translated by a range of Afghan women, but written originally in Pashto and Dari. We then have Cursed Bunny, which is translated from Korean, Paradise translated from Spanish, and A Man Called Uva translated from Swedish. So this is going to be a pretty cool world tour. I feel like Justin Bieber. But before I get on to reading these books, I wanted to quickly convince you why you should read translated fiction as well. If this is something that you've never considered before, then my first question to you would be, why would you assume that the best literature would have been written in English. For me personally, as a reader, as a writer, as a literary critic, I cannot overstate how formative reading translated fiction has been. Because in other countries, in other cultures, there are different rules, codes, conventions for storytelling, which are both obeyed and broken. And that's the beauty of it. That can be down to how linear a narrative is, whether characters are given names, what the general themes are, what the general concerns of the author are, how people and society are discussed and presented, and how the narrative voice expresses itself. By reading these works, your grasp on what literature is and can be will be expanded infinitely. And to me, that is so exciting. There are mesmerizing and captivating horror stories coming out of Argentina and brilliant microscopic character studies coming out of Japan, and developing your knowledge about what writing is happening all around the world can really, really improve your personal reading experience. I suppose the most obvious point about reading translated fiction is that authors from around the world pour their experiences into their novels. Writing a novel is an act of vulnerability, and they are sharing their perspective of their country and their culture. And you can learn a lot from that, but it is really important to remember that they are not here to educate you. Books not written originally in English are not written necessarily with English readers at the front of their mind. You were not anticipated as the primary audience of that work. And so the point of these books is not just to teach English people about Brazilian culture or Chinese customs or what it's like in Mozambique. They exist to tell stories that happen to occur in those locations. And so your learning experience is not spoon fed to you, it's actually inadvertent, which is also really cool, I think. I would actually say that it makes your awareness of these cultures and countries much more nuanced, whether that's down to how people communicate with one another, the relationships that they have, the food that they eat, and the ways that they celebrate. You may also encounter some geopolitics within there too, but often it will just be in passing. It'll be taken for granted that the reader knows these things, just like how if a book is set in London, it's probably going to be assumed that you know what the Thames is and what the Blitz was. So while you can definitely use books like these to travel in a literary sense, it's important to remember when you discuss and review these books that it is not the author's responsibility to explain a country's customs and culture to you. This is not a lesson, it's a piece of art. And I guess the final point that I wanted to make on the joys of translated fiction is the fantastic uniqueness of the experience of reading a translated book, because every book that has been translated is also a dialogue or a conversation between the translator and the author. And that is an unbelievably powerful thing. I've been very lucky and privileged to get to attend some interviews, some live talks, where translators and the original authors discuss the process of creating a book like this, and what an intimate and also intricate process that is. It was really enlightening, so I'd really recommend googling or having a look on YouTube to see if you can find interviews or talks of that kind of thing. But truly, I think people who translate novels are superhuman. They are incredible. It is such a skill. Because they're not just translating this word for this word. Otherwise, you could just put it in Google Translate or Deeple and say, here you go, publish the book. They are also trying to capture the tone, the style, the feeling, the atmosphere, the approach the original author has to storytelling. They have got to experience that for themselves in its original form, and they are now translating that to you, to us. That is precisely why I am such a big advocate for putting translators' names on the covers and 
crediting them in these videos. And unfortunately, the only one of my collection of seven books that has the translator's name on the cover is Cursed Bunny. Hopefully that is something that will change and improve in the future, but we'll see. For now, hopefully I've convinced you that reading translated books is a really special experience. I hope that you're on board and uh, hopefully we can find some great recommendations as well. So let's get on with actually doing some reading and I'll let you know what I think of these seven books. At Night All Blood is Black is a novella by David Diop and translated from the French by Anna Moskovakis. Now, my current goal is to get to a point where I can read books like this in French in their original language. And we're working towards it, we're not quite there yet, so I did read this in English, but I have been learning French using this brilliant website called Lingoda, and I'm very excited to let you know that they have very kindly sponsored today's video. This is a website I use every single day to take French classes online. They're super easy to book, class sizes are five maximum, so you're always involved, you're always engaged, you get a lot of personal time with the teacher, but you can also take one-on-one -on -one classes on Lingoda if you want to. Personally, I found that being in a class has really improved my confidence with speaking and also listening to other people speaking French. Every teacher I've had so far has been so lovely and made me feel so comfortable, so at ease. And of course the beauty of it being online is that it's super flexible, you can do it from anywhere and book classes at a time that suits you and suits your lifestyle, which for me makes me much more likely to actually stick with it. It definitely feels to me like a safe space for learning and asking questions and sometimes being wrong, but also checking fundamental things like your pronunciation, your grammar, asking when you don't know a word. And the website is super smooth and streamlined so it's very easy to find when your classes are and what ones you need to book and your class materials and revise afterwards, etc. And each lesson will focus on a different element of like vocabulary, grammar, pronunciation, or speaking. However, the coolest thing about Lingoda is the Lingoda language sprint. Because if you want to reach new heights in your chosen language, but you're struggling with the commitment or the motivation, this is for you. The way a Lingoda sprint works is that you pay for your classes. And then if you attend every single one, you get your money back. It's as simple as that. There's the sprint where you need to attend 15 classes in a month to get 50% of your money back, or a super sprint where you need to attend 30 classes in a month and then you get 100% of your money back. To put that into perspective, that's one hour of class time every day. At the time I'm uploading this, the next sprint starts on the 11th of July, which I'm absolutely going to be joining. You can learn English, business English, French, Spanish, or German, and classes are happening all the time. So if you fancy it, and from experience, I would absolutely recommend, you can go to try.lingo com slash Jack Edwards. The link will be in the description. You can find all the information that you need and sign up for a sprint. And of course, I have a cheeky little discount code for you. You can use Jack20 to save either 20 euros or $25 on your sprint registration fee. And best of luck, bon chance, buena suerte. Thank you, Lingoda. I'm so chuffed to be working with them because I love their service. I think it's a great initiative. And now, on with some books. At night, all blood is black. I think this is one of the best titles ever. This actually won the 2021 International Booker Prize, and I can absolutely understand why. This is harrowing, unrelenting, unsparing. It's about grief, about trauma, about madness, and we follow two Senegalese soldiers who are fighting for the French army in the First World War, when unfortunately one of these two men is dreadfully wounded. He is in absolute agony, and so he begs his best friend Alpha to put him out of his misery. Now Alpha, who is our central protagonist, cannot bring himself to kill his friend, which ultimately causes more pain and suffering for that friend, and this is a decision that haunts him. It completely consumes him, it drives him to insanity. And so At Night All Blood is Black is more than just a war novel. It's also the psychological undoing of a man and a descent into a really horrific mental state. It is gory, it is brutal, you can probably tell this is not for the faint hearted, but I just thought that the prose was so electrifying and taut. So let me read you some of it. I am reconciling immobility and mobility the stillness of time and the flow of time, the past and the present. I am reconciling the rooted trees and the wind that rustles their leaves, the earth and the sky. Like, come on now, that is beautiful. And there's also actually a really interesting section towards the end of the book, which is about translation, the art of translation and retelling other people's stories, which I think must have been so meta for Anna when she translated this book. Like. Was this play about us? <laughs> Let me read it to you. To translate is never simple. To translate is to betray at the borders. It's to cheat. 
It's to trade one sentence for another. To translate is one of the only human activities in which one is required to lie about the details to convey the truth at large. To translate is to risk understanding better than others that the truth about a word is not single, but double, even triple, quadruple, or quintuple. To translate is to distance oneself from God's truth, which as everyone knows or believes, is single. I thought that was quite funny, and with that in mind, <laughs> let's go and read another translated book. Death and the Penguin is by Andrei Kirkov and translated from the Russian by George Bird. And I actually bought this book when I was at Hay Literary Festival because they were raising money for the crisis in Ukraine by selling books by Ukrainian authors. So that's why I have this. And I have been desperate to read it. Now, Death and the Penguin was published in 1996, five years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so the backdrop of this book is a bleak moral landscape. It was a time where that society was really struggling. Bribery and corruption had completely infiltrated. Hospitals couldn't provide for patients. And in this book, mafia assassinations start to occur. But more specifically, this book is about a man called Victor and his penguin, Misha. I'm sure you can guess who my favorite character was. Misha is this brilliant literary invention. And what the penguin contributes to the novel is that he's in the wrong environment. He's not happy. These are not the optimal conditions for him to survive in. And Victor, his owner, kind of mirrors that. He feels that way too in Ukrainian society at the time. And so within the confines of this post-Soviet landscape, this is a very existentialist book. We really fluctuate between the character feeling totally calm and serene and then extremely paranoid because Victor gets a job as the writer of eulogies. And it turns out he's very good at it. And at first he finds it somewhat frustrating that he's writing all of this amazing work and none of it is being published because he is writing eulogies about people who haven't died yet. So he's essentially preparing eulogies about politicians and socialites and people known in this society. So he's finding that tough until people do actually start dying and his obituaries start being published. And maybe that's actually worse because without spoilers, things start to take a bit of a sinister turn. Um, although most of that is implicitly perceived rather than being kind of explicit. He doesn't necessarily tell us exactly what's going on. But the book overall is a real tragic comedy and also a political satire. It's humorous in a very, very dark way and both morbid but also quite touching. If you love a twist, this book will absolutely tickle your pickle. Though I will warn you that one of the quirks of this novel is that often it focuses on the mundane, very standard domestic life of these characters when really you wanna know about the crazy shit that's going on around them. So the tone is surprisingly light, which juxtaposes the kind of severity of their situation. But that is the point. It's very deadpan and funny in a dry way. What I would say is that it wasn't my favorite reading experience, but as a piece of art and as a time capsule, I think it's magnificent. And also I definitely now hold the opinion that every book would be improved with the addition of a penguin. I think I might have to write one into my own novel that I'm working on at the moment, so. Much to think about. <laughs> Let's move on. It's later in the day now, but I just finished <laughs> another book. This is Heaven by Mieko Kawakami and translated from Japanese by Sam Bet and David Boyd. That's interesting that there's two translators. As you can see, it's not a long book. It's got its summer body, but but, 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 <laughs> that does not mean that it doesn't pack a punch because it does WWE style. This is a knockout blow. Heaven revolves around a character, I think he's 14, who is being relentlessly bullied by his classmates because he has a lazy eye, something that he can't do anything about. And so he never fights back. He's super, super passive. There's also a girl in his class who is also being subjected to the same torment. And so the pair of them form a kind of unlikely alliance, I suppose. It's a kinship through mutual experience and they really console one another But what problematizes that relationship is the fact that it grew from trauma from mutual suffering So the book is heartbreaking, but also so endearing and really what I just described to you is just the framework of the novel like that plot just sets up for a really interesting conversation here. Kawakami has that conversation by discussing the very nature of violence and bullying against the weak. Why do people single out 
those they perceive as weaker than them and then harass them, make their lives hell. What is the psychology that makes people abuse the vulnerable? So there's definitely a critique of ableism and classism within the book. Yeah, it really kind of considers the philosophy of violence in quite a compelling way. And then on top of that, we also have a kind of analysis of the friendship that is formed because of violence. Can two people really support each other when what bonds them is terror and fear? So Kojima, who is the female character, essentially believes that she is a martyr and all of this violence is happening to her for a reason. There's actually some greater meaning, there's a lesson to be learned by all. And look, I don't necessarily agree with that, nor does Kawakami. What I really liked about her writing is that she presents different opinions, different perspectives, but she never guides you towards one or the other, she just lets you make up your own opinion. She sort of just lays everything out and says, here you go, <laughs> work it out for yourself. I picked this up and also a few of the other books that you'll see later in the video because it was nominated for this year's uh, International Booker Prize, which is a really good place and hub for finding uh, translated fiction recommendations. It's a really great showcase of contemporary translated fiction. And I thought this book was good. I thought it was okay. I don't think I found it as profound as maybe I expected, but generally I don't love reading books about bullying or about being a teenager in general. Like, I don't know, maybe it's something about being in your early 20s that you no longer want to read about being a teenager. So I think that it's not you, it's me. I think that this is a case of me picking up a book which covers themes that I don't really want to read about. I just wanted to highlight that because obviously whenever you read anything, there's an element of subjective response, right? This book does feature long and detailed descriptions of how relentless the bullying is and it's a lot. I don't know if that much was necessary because for me, the more interesting part of this book was the sort of philosophical musings. I also found the characters like a little bit too mature for their age. They were a bit too precocious to make it believable. So yeah, a bit of a mixed review from me, but still erring more on the positive side, I would say. There was, it's not a bad book and I will catch you when I've read another one. Oh no, I'm wearing my French t-shirt. I should have worn this when I read the French book. Damn it. It's too late now, I already reviewed it. That's ruined my day. Oh, I'm fuming. <laughs> I need to get a grip. You are never gonna believe what's just happened. So I look down at my foot and I have this thing stuck to my sock. And you know what it is? It's the grip from the chair. <laughs> like you put it on the bottom of the chair leg so that it doesn't scratch the floor. It's a grip. And I just said that I need to get a grip. <laughs> and then immediately found one. Wow, <laughs> all these books and you couldn't write that. I'm losing the plot, what is going on? Anyway, the next book that I read is this one. My pen is the wing of a bird. I just finished it and I loved it. This is a really important and precious collection of stories by Afghan women, displaying and celebrating a wide range of authors and translators and also languages. There are two different languages featured in here that are then both translated into English. There are 18 stories, so it wouldn't be possible for me to credit all of the different writers who worked on this, but it's a real window into this time in Afghanistan, a very pivotal time too in the country's history. This feels like such a singular achievement, which I don't think will ever be replicated again, so I feel very lucky to have read this. The curation of this as an anthology is really, really special. So, let me read you some quotes. It would be rude not to. This is from Daughter Number 8 by Fresh Dagani. I wash a big pot and put it on the stove. I increase the heat. My life is like the boiling water in this pot. Happiness evaporating from it like the steam. Then we have My Pillow's Journey of 11,876 Kilometers by Ferengis El Yassi and then translated by Dr. Zubair Papalzai. I have finally accepted that my peaceful sleep was not bound to my pillow. My sleep was bound to the warm embrace of my country. And then finally, let's go with I Don't Have the Flying Wings by Batul Haidari and translated by Pawana Fayaz. I dance as if I have been liberated from my body. Despite the heat of my skin, my liberty keeps me cool. I admire my own beauty. I open my thin lips, ready to sing out the poem that has always rested in my throat. And I think at a time when so many women are silenced, this is just so unbelievably powerful. We hear stories of an old lady who goes out every day just to make sure that someone notices when she stops appearing and she stops being able to go out of the house. We have women working at a local news station, which is Bond. It explores gender identity, female camaraderie, isolation, work life, family, war. And I'd highly recommend this collection. I found it so compelling, but also devastating and shattering but beautiful at the same time. So lots of contradictions there, 
but it's a very important book. So yeah, my pen is the wing of a bird. And if you feel that you need to get a grip, here's your sign, get a grip. <laughs> Okay, so, hello. A couple more days have passed, and I've read a couple more books. I am running late to go out, but I have to tell you about these right now, I think. <laughs> Firstly, we have Paradise by Fernanda Melcher, who is a Mexican author, and then this was translated from Spanish by Sophie Hughes. And listen, I'm not gonna lie to you, I read this book in an absolute frenzy. It was unhinged. I walked to the park, opened the book, read it cover to cover, and then got up and left. <laughs> and I thought if anyone watched me doing that, they would think, this NPC is glitching. What is he doing? But I thoroughly enjoyed myself and I could not stop reading this book. I had to know what was gonna happen. And the last 30 pages of this book just climax in an absolute crescendo. It's wild. Fernanda Melcher and Sophie Hughes had me in the palm of their hands. Obviously, I haven't read the original Spanish version, so I can't really comment on the quality of translation, but I feel like together they just captured this real rage, this stream of anger. It's a torrent of disgusting and dirty words just absolutely pouring out of the pages, which I thought was stunning. The book is about two boys growing up on this luxury kind of housing complex. One lives there and one works there. The latter despises that job. He desperately wants to leave, but his mum takes all his wages, so he's really stuck in that place. And then the other guy spends his days just fantasizing about his married neighbor and just thinking the most masochistic and depraved things about her. It is deeply disturbing. He is a menace to society. He's like the worst guy ever. <laughs> yeah, just hideous, but so brilliantly created as a character. These are two broken people who gravitate towards each other out of pure convenience. However, when those two meet and collaborate and confide in each other, it's like a bomb goes off. And they hatch this mindless and terrifying scheme in order to acquire everything they feel they deserve, everything they feel entitled to by any means necessary. And when I say that, I really do mean any means. It's violent, it's tragic, and the pages just turn themselves. And now my only plans for tomorrow are one, read the final book for this video, and two, go out and buy Fernanda Melcher's other book, Hurricane Season, because everyone is telling me I have to read it. So. I will do what I gotta do. Paradise had me completely enraptured. It's a study of a really toxic form of masculinity, but I did enjoy reading it. So it's a hard thing to recommend. I'm not necessarily recommending it um, because it is so horrific, but uh, I liked it. So on to the next one. Well, I guess this is a similar vibe really, <laughs> but this is Cursed Bunny, which is by Bora Chung and translated from Korean by Anton He, who I actually had the pleasure of meeting at Hay Festival and such a weird coincidence, but I'd actually bought his book and then he came over to say hello. And I was like, holy moly, Anton He, I just went to the bookstore and bought your book. So then he signed it for me. And now this is my prized possession. You will have to wrestle this out of my hands. I mean, also look how gorgeous this is. And let me just tell you, this book is freaking crazy. <laughs> Maybe that's the general theme of this video so far. I don't know. But this is a collection of 10, I think, short stories, which are so radically different to one another. Sometimes it is vile and violent and absurd, and then other times it's sci-fi or a parable, kind of a fairy tale. This collection blurs more lines than Robin Thicke. <laughs> Trust me. The first story in here is about a woman who, every time she goes to the toilet, yeah, a head appears from the bowl, which kind of speaks to her and encourages her to continue using the toilet because this head is growing bigger and stronger every time she goes. You can imagine what it's kind of made up of. And it is so gross and so captivating and there's brilliant twists in this book, not just in that story, but all throughout. I kind of don't want to tell you too much more because I think it's better the less you know, just so you really can have that shock value and experience those enigmas for the very first time. But yeah, those twists just completely warp what you think is going to happen or even what is capable <laughs> of happening. Bora Chung as an author is just great at delivering those moments. Whether that is in a creepy, a cruel, a strange, a terrifying way, it always ends up catching up to you. And despite all of these stories being so radically diverse, the masterful way that they're told and executed actually gives them some sort of cohesion. Genuinely, I think that the talent of the storytelling 
is the glue that acts as an adhesive in this collection. If you do read this, I hope that it rattles you <laughs> as much as it rattled me. It shook me like a freaking maraca, but this is certainly some of the best prose that I've read this week. So Anton Her, you're a genius, and this man had not one, but two books longlisted for this year's International Booker Prize, so if that doesn't tell you, then I don't know what will. He's critically acclaimed, baby. This man has more talent in his little finger than the rest of us have in our whole bodies. But you know what? Good for him. I am immediately going to be ordering every other book that he has translated. I can't wait to read them. And yeah, that is my conclusion about these two books. They were both unsettling, but an absolute feast. I feel like I've just had an 11 course meal and I thoroughly enjoyed. And now I probably need to leave two minutes ago to make it to the actual meal I'm having, but I will see you tomorrow for the final book of this little challenge. Hugs and kisses. <laughs> oh man. Ooh, this book, the end of this book got me. Damn. Okay, um, give me a minute. This is A Man Called Uva by Frederick Backman and translated from the Swedish by Henning Koch. And, whew, okay, so you know it's sad. <laughs> it's a tearjerker for sure. And it's very rare that a book sets me off like that, but oh, I love little full circle moments. It's very satisfying, this book. It's very charming. It is about this cantankerous, grumpy old man, apparently called a curmudgeon. Um, that's a new word for me, but I think it means like, a grumpy old person. And Uva is this stickler for rules. He is single-handedly keeping up order in his local neighborhood. It's very important to him to stop people from driving in residential areas and putting their bins out on the right day, things like that. He's stubborn, he's sometimes mean, but his heart is so big and you end up just really warming to him. And I think this is an exercise in empathy, like, understanding his loneliness and his motivations and the reasons that he is the way that he is. And I guess appreciating that every person, no matter how they behave, has had a life, has experienced tragedy, and is just human, I guess. This is a very sweet kind of domestic book. You're really warm to the different characters. It's a really rich cast of people. And I think this would be a great book to buy like your dad or your grandparents. At times it's funny, at times it's moving, often it is both at once. It's witty, it's wry, but also so generous with how it treats its characters and a really beautiful and exquisite reflection on loss and love and one man trying to navigate the world. And <sighs> yeah, this got me. This hit me in the feels and you know I love a sad book, so um, this is like the perfect mix of funny and sad. I really, really enjoyed this book. I think I'm gonna miss these characters too. You know, my grandmother always says this, the sign of a really good book is when you miss the characters after finishing reading it. I think I'm gonna recommend this to her actually. <laughs> so this was A Man Called Uva. That is the end of this video. And what a way to end it. I did not expect to wrap up this video with tears in my freaking eyes. I'm a mess. Hopefully we're so far into the video that most people have stopped watching it. Anyways, I thoroughly enjoyed reading these books. As I said, reading translated fiction is such an enriching and enlightening and important experience. So I'd highly recommend Take this as your sign that your next book that you read should be something that's been translated into your native language. Also, one thing I do think is worth noting, I've been thinking about it a lot this week since filming my kind of intro to this video. Obviously this experience of reading translated fiction in the way that I personally do and the way that I explained at the beginning of this video is probably quite unique to people whose primary first language is English. So for people in, you know, Australia, the USA, the UK, whereas obviously for a lot of you watching, I'm sure you know, books like Harry Potter would have been translated maybe into your native language so you could read it as a kid. So yeah, I guess I wanted to acknowledge that a lot of countries are much more accustomed to reading translated fiction and much more open to reading translated fiction than perhaps English speaking countries are. And hopefully the tide is turning a little bit and more native English speakers will be reading translated fiction and opening themselves up to things that are so great like all of these books right here. This has been a wonderful week and a wonderful opportunity to showcase some really excellent translated fiction. 
Thank you so, so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please do give this video a like and you can subscribe for more from me. I'm always knocking about, I'm always here talking about books. So um, I'd love to have you as part of the family. Also, don't forget that the link to Lingoda is down below. Thank you so, so much to Lingoda for sponsoring this video. Au revoir, all the best, stay in touch, have a wonderful day, abiento, and uh, I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.